Today on This Week Health. You, you have to figure out where am I going to draw that line? Where am I going to balance so that I am moving forward? I am productively pushing the envelope, but I've also got strength and foundation so that if some of these initiatives drop, they don't play out. Uh, what does that look like? Welcome to Newsday, a This Week Health newsroom show. My name is Bill Russell. I'm a former CIO for a 16 hospital system and creator of This Week Health, a set of channels dedicated to keeping health IT staff current and engaged. For five years, we've been making podcasts that amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. Special thanks to our Newsday show partners, and we have a lot of them this year, which I am really excited about. Cedar sinai Accelerator, ClearSense, CrowdStrike, Digital Scientists, Optimum Healthcare IT, Pure Storage, SureTest, TauSight, Lumion, and VMware. We appreciate them investing in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Now, onto the show. All right, it's Newsday, and today we are gonna have a fun conversation. There's an awful lot going on in the industry. Uh, today we are joined by Robert Elliott, VP of ServiceNow Services for Optimum Health IT. Robert. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Glad to be here. If I'm not mistaken, this is your first time on the show. Is that correct? That is true, yes. ServiceNow, this is an interesting space that you're in. Tell us a little bit about the services that uh, Optimum does around ServiceNow. Yes, absolutely. So I find it a very exciting space and it's really taken off and boomed. And I'd say probably the last five years with taking much more of an enterprise focus and then within the last three to four, even with much more of an industry focus and starting to address things within healthcare that are a bit more nuanced and a bit more unique to industry. So our services really span the platform. We address everything from supporting with advisory and with technical implementation, road mapping and architecture around the core applications that are built and provided by ServiceNow to doing more custom solutions where there is a use case that ties into some form of service delivery, ties into some form of driving workflow, and we're able to use the platform in order to support that. So a lot of interesting things, whether they be core administrative or whether they be a little bit more unique to industry and uh, specialized in flavor and a little more front office oriented. It's I remember the day when we used to bring in service now for all the ITIL stuff and the IT back office and whatnot. That's no longer the case, is it? I mean, that's just part of a small part of what it does. Yeah, for sure. It's still very often the foot in the door, right? And so they're known for that with 20 years about behind them, 19, something like that with those IT service management type domains. But having proven that and proven that model and that success, it can now expand out to all kinds of areas. So everything from HR case management to with a, a legal type situation, supporting legal cases to maybe you need to do service delivery oriented work for revenue integrity. It could be anybody within the organization, as long as it fits that model. And then even beyond that, there's so many things you can address just from a workflow point of view. So it, it really has grown. Well, we're going to, we're going to talk about some, some interesting stories. We'll talk about healthcare spending. I think is one of the topics we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about some cautionary tales in healthcare. I thought that was an interesting article. I want to start with you. <laughs> I want to start about talking about the future to, to start with. There's this LinkedIn post that was out there. The horses have run out of the barn and the barn was burnt down. And it, it has this post and it's a conversation between Ahmad Mustek, the founder and CEO of Stability AI and Peter Diamandis. They discussed how AI and humanity will intertwine. And these were 10 takeaways that Alex Banks had in this LinkedIn post. And I want to just, I, I, actually, I just want to go through some of these with you and, and get your feeling on some of them. As we are looking at healthcare, as we're looking at the evolution of technology in healthcare, it's interesting to, to just, just see where, and, and just to be fair, these two are very much futurists. They're not talking about, hey, what's going to happen next week? They're talking... What's it going to look like five, 10 years down the road? Uh, let's start with number one. We have figured out how to make humans scale and you won't need as many humans. And they have a couple quotes here. Using GPT-4 is like using a really talented analyst with a bad memory. When we fix the memory component, this could mean huge disruption or abundance. Are we starting to really think through how we uh, can get things done more effectively with less humans. Is that one of the conversations that's going on? Or are we still trying to avoid, is that still taboo to talk in those kinds of terms? 
Yeah, well, you bring up a fair question. And it's one that you'll hear ServiceNow ex executives address in some of the webinars and presentations they do because there's there has been so much taboo and fear around talking, well, does this eliminate jobs? Does this have this type of an impact that really raises flags and concerns people? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's appropriate, right? I think we need to be thinking as to what the impact of this is. If you go a little bit further down, and this one ties straight into that, they talk about five years from now, what is the developer landscape going to look like? Yeah. And we're already seeing this in the ServiceNow world. When OpenAI opened up their APIs, I had a handful of folks on my team, and I know we're not unique in this, who went into ServiceNow. And if you're in a certain context, you can click a button, enter a prompt, and it'll reach out to the API and pull back some code that we can plug right into that context. And it's not quite at the point where you can just let it run. I know one of the folks in that interview did said a little bit, they said, an asteroid game just based off of a prompt and they were able to run it with no changes. I'm, I don't think we're seeing that in practice yet, but we're close, right? You may not need a junior developer. You may be able to use that for your foundation, have a senior who actually tweaks it. But what I think the challenge is, and maybe this just exposes it, is that historically, I don't think our biggest problem, at least within the ServiceNow domain, and this probably varies between areas, but I don't think it's been a, a lack of developers. There are challenges around that, but I think it's much more about strategic vision and program leadership such that you can see what are the outcomes that we're looking to achieve? Am I aligning with product? Am I aligning with outcomes? Where am I looking to go? And, and looking at that at a higher level, having a vision for what you want to do with the technology and then being able to execute against it. The build, the technical pieces, those are challenging. And this helps to address those. And maybe we can move faster and maybe we can actually execute more efficiently. But I think that we're a lot further off from this type of a capability being able to drive that kind of higher level piece of things that is so frequently missing from successful or from programs to make them successful. Yeah. So let me ask you this, just from a from an education standpoint, it says now 41 percent of all code on GitHub is AI generated is was one of the quotes in here and we may never need programmers again. And and I'm thinking of this world with a with artificial intelligence and automation. What's, what are we telling high schoolers? Remember when we, they used to bring like people like you and I in to talk to high schoolers and we used to say, hey, these are the things you could consider studying and these are, we're in that sort of phase where we're looking at this stuff going, man, what would you study? What, what are the skills that are gonna be required for the next generation coming out? Are they gonna have to be fluent and conversant with AI? Are there gonna be a multiple sets of AI tools that they're going to interact with? depending on what field they're in and will we be educating AI tools? Will we be, will a lot of the things that were done by my generation, because you don't have nearly as much gray hair as I do, my generation, will a lot of that be automated moving forward? What, what would you be telling that high school senior or, or junior today? I think it falls into two domains. I think it falls into concepts and I think it falls into tool use. And when I'm thinking concepts, I'm thinking in the same way that I bring my more programming oriented frame of mind to building a solution with ServiceNow. So is there code involved? Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. If you have a complex challenge, you're most likely going to use some degree of code to solve for that, even within ServiceNow. But more than that, I'm bringing the overall object-oriented ideas, compartmentalization, these different concepts to bear within a design and within the way that I approach a problem. I think that those types of concepts, whether they be more business-oriented, more technical-oriented, whatever they might be, will continue to persist and apply across models just as they take the transition from a coding context to more of a system configuration-based context. There's a lot of parallels. So I think that's one. I think the other, and uh, maybe the more important, but you know, both very important. I think the other is that, in my opinion, the future will heavily leverage the ability to effectively use tools. And that kind of came into play with this post too. It's right now it's writing a prompt. Maybe that won't be the case very long. I think even in the, the conversation that they had that this post references, they talked a bit about the natural language improvement will be such that your ability to effectively construct the prompt won't be as much of a thing. So the tools will evolve. It'll be a matter of, how can you take a challenge, business, technical, whatever, and leverage the tools that are available to you and identify and execute a solution? It doesn't have to be coding or build. You need to be able to take whatever it is and run with it. And a lot of that comes into, I don't know, softer skills and, and competence and those types of strengths. Yeah, it is definitely an interesting time. I My son and I have been playing around and my son is a Deloitte consultant, so he's not young. But we've been playing around with some of these uh, prompt-based image generators. 
And mm -hmm. it's really fascinating to just type a bunch of things in there and then get a photographic quality image of, of something that you have dreamt up in your head. And just, and I have no artistic ability whatsoever, but I now can create on a new, in a new way, on a new canvas than I ever have before. I can program, but give, put a paintbrush in my hand. I can't do a thing, but now I could actually create art from, from my mind, from words. And that's an example of, of just giving people a whole new set of tools to play with than they ever had before. I want to change the, the topic a little bit. We're going to talk about uh, reduce unnecessary healthcare spending. This article was fascinating. Uh, United States spends an exorbitant amount of, on healthcare, by far the most in the world, 4.3 trillion, and average roughly 13,000 per person. It is also well known that despite the huge healthcare spending in the United States, we don't get what we pay for in terms of outcomes. Many experts point to reducing unnecessary and wasteful healthcare spending. Let's see. So, Dr. William Schrank of Humana Health Insurance Company and colleague estimated approximately 25% of healthcare spending is wasteful. Of that proportion, an estimated 516 billion could be recovered or saved in three main areas, administrative, clinical, and operational. Recent reports from Dr. Schrank and Harvard professor David Cutler with McKinsey outlined solutions in each of these three categories. And then they go through each one. It's a fairly long article. They talk about, let's see, individual organizations, small scale intervention could be implemented by individual organizations. Options include streamlining processes for submitting claims, automating repetitive work, in human resources and finance, leveraging new technologies such as analytics and cloud computing. This is probably, this probably falls directly into your area and some of the work that you're doing of automating some of these things and these procedures, because that's ServiceNow is that kind of platform that you could really drive waste out. As you read this article, what are some of the things that jumped into your head? Yeah. So two major themes in my mind, and you're very much right as far as the efficiencies around administrative spend, things like that. So that's the second area where I'll go. The first, I'm going to stay in my lane, but I'm going to ride right up against the edge of it and think conceptually here, how we approach problems, how I approach problems. So when we're looking to implement new application service now, maybe it's service management solution, doesn't really matter, whatever it is. The first thing that I recommend that anyone look at is one, should we be doing this process in the first place? Assuming we can get past that, are we doing it in the right way? What are the ways that we can improve the way that we are doing whatever X, Y, Z. You're a wild man. Should we be doing this? You start with, no. should we be doing this? Pro Isn't it amazing yeah. that how many times you, you look at something and you go, hey, I'm not sure why we do this. Like, it's just always been here. All right, well, what would happen if we eliminated it? I'm yeah. not sure yeah. anything would happen. All right, let's just do that. There you go. I don't, but I mean, we, get, we should be asking those questions, right? So is this something worth investing in? Should we eliminate it altogether? Almost always, we can make it better. We can improve it so that we're not just making something broken faster. We have a really efficient broken process now. It's automated. Great. But I apply that here because I thought there was a lot of good stuff in this article, but I think they also operated from the frame of mind that our models are okay. Like our models are good. We just need to fix things about them. So I would raise is the question here. Are there models that we should just pivot from entirely? Should we rethink the way that we're approaching some of these challenges? Because yes, they have a lot of waste, but maybe if we thought about it a different way, approached it a different way, we wouldn't need to address that waste because we'd be handling it in a better way. I'm not going to get specific, just proposing the frame of mind about it. <laughs> so that's one piece. The other, when we get into those administrative functions, and I think they called out both IT and HR, they called out finance and some of the others. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's workflow potential to automate those, to streamline process around them, to standardize, to increase visibility. And if we're able to put uh, workflow driven through ServiceNow or through another technology in place where we're no longer addressing those in email inboxes with black holes associated with them and spreadsheets and all that kind of thing, it sounds like a little bit of a, a dated pitch at this point, but unfortunately it's not. We still run into this stuff all the time. So there's definitely waste there and there's definitely opportunity to address that in a way that saves time and makes it less error prone too, frankly. We'll get back to our show in just a minute. Our rural healthcare systems face unique challenges in America. Join us for our upcoming free webinar, Rural Healthcare Challenges and Opportunities on August 3rd at one o'clock Eastern time. We'll unpack these challenges and look for opportunities for smaller health systems to take the lead in the delivery of care to this underserved population. Join us as we look to unlock the potential of technology to make a difference in the lives of thousands in rural communities. 
Remember, August 3rd, 1 p.m. Eastern Time and 10 a.m. Pacific Time. You can register over on thisweekhealth.com. Now, back to our show. It's interesting it, because we're going to be entering an election cycle. If not, I mean, at, the election cycles now start like the day after the election ends. Right. Um, but we, we are definitely entering into an election cycle. You're seeing more and more of it in the news. And it's interesting because the healthcare will be one of the conversations and many people will make the case it's broken. And uh, there's plenty of statistics you could throw at it to say, hey, this is broken. It could be done more efficient. It's done more efficiently in other countries, so forth and so on. And they will compare, they'll compare the United States to, I don't know, some Scandinavian country and whatever. And you just, you look at that and you're like, okay, scale matters. And we have large swaths of land in between major cities that you have to figure out how you're going to deliver care and those kind of things. So things are a little different. It's interesting that as we enter into this, it used to be that we would point to Canada and we would point to NHS in, in England and we would say, look, this is what the future looks like. This is what's possible. And just recently I read articles on both countries, and most specifically the NHS, where they're not happy with it. For the first time ever, you're hearing people, well, maybe not for the first time ever, but for a long time now, they're essentially saying, look, it's taking too long to get care. You can't get in. We have not kept up with innovation and whatever. So that's one of the, one of the problems is when we approach these challenges and these problems, we just naturally just look and say, well, that one's better. Let's take that one. Instead of stepping back from the problem and saying, okay, What's, what are the positives of that one? What does work? Well, I, hey, everybody's covered. Everybody gets preventative care. And I, okay, that works. But how do we maintain innovation in that? Because eventually what happens if you have a government takeover, you have innovation tends to slow down and that's being kind, tends to stop generally is what happens. And so it will be interesting going into this election cycle because we will hear a lot of different healthcare needs to be redone, revamped. But I think now more than ever, it's really interesting. There's an opportunity in the US given the technology that is coming forth. We started with the, hey, what could be possible with these new technologies? The horse is out of the barn and the barn is burning. That article or that series of premises and their premise is AI is gonna fundamentally change every business in the world. And I've seen that over and over again, I've seen I've seen people like Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan essentially say, hey, AI is gonna change everything and it's gonna change it fairly dramatically. And so you have all, we have that potential for dramatic change happening at a time when we're talking about what can we do different? I like articles like this because it, it causes us to think if we truly do have a trillion in waste, could we make this better in and of itself? I'm, I'm, I'm curious if that's a, so that was me pontificating for a while. If you'd like to pontificate for a while, please go ahead. Well, I, it's a huge shift to turn, right? And it, it's a very complicated picture. And I think the episode of the show that you did recently talking about the, some of the different costs and nuances that live within healthcare, if you haven't lived within a healthcare environment to understand some of those, you may not have uh, a bit of the context that is important to, to play into the challenge that's that we're facing. So come election cycle, it's going to be a lot of high level talk about what's good and what's bad, but you need that context. And I do think that the evolution of these AI tools will make us more enabled, will give us just that more tools to be able to effectively tackle these problems. And maybe, maybe we get a few more tugboats out there that can push the ship in a different direction and move it a little more quickly because of what we have available to us and just the pace of change, the significant size of the models that we're operating from and things like that. So it'll be interesting to watch for sure. And it'll be interesting to see how concrete and how within context the conversations are. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to hit you up for investment advice here. We're going to do 10 healthcare startup cautionary tales. And the reason I want to take a look at this is uh, people like me are saying, man, and Jamie Dimon and others are saying, man, this AI thing is really going to change things. Even if it wasn't for AI, I would say the level of automation that's available to us now that we've digitized the medical record and we have all sorts of APIs set up between systems and whatnot, we actually have the ability to automate things we never did before to uh, digital, everything's moving to the phone. We can now move things in ones and zeros all over the place and uh, AI being layered in on top of that. There is an awful lot of hype going on right now. 
like just the crazy hype. So it's good every now and then to come back down to the ground and take a look at some of the things that have happened. We look at these 10 healthcare caution details that aren't Theranos. You have uh, Proteus Digital Health, you have uh, Paratherapeutics, and some of these are digital. Some of them are companies. You have Haven, which was the Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan Chase, and Amazon partnership. MindStrong, which is around behavioral health spot, which was setting up these, I would say, fairly large stations in places where people could go and have get health services. I think you could see these things in airports and that kind of stuff. Home Hero was senior home care marketplace. And I found that people who try to go directly to consumers for healthcare struggle with a with an economic model. Zenefits, I used Zenefits at one point. I didn't even realize they were out of business. I left them because their services got a little goofy, but they had oh, they had some problems with the law. They they started to do some crazy stuff with insurance, outcome health, and some others. You know, if you're in that boat of trying to decide what companies you're going to invest in. Let's let's say we just made you a CIO for a major health system, for HCA. We just made you the CIO for HCA. I don't, don't, and you're looking at all these different things that are coming your way. How do you determine which ones are gonna be around? I mean, the landscape's changing so rapidly. That's true. So there are a handful of things that play into it in my mind. I think that for one, you have to look at the past leadership. And I like this article because it told you where their leaders are now. And so it prompted me to do a little bit of digging into the organizations being led by some of the folks, particularly when you get into that latter bucket that was more ethical concerns in the previous organization. You got to think, all right, is this a one-time thing? Are we going to see a trend here with the future organization? So I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look at who the leadership is and, and what they've done in the past and the way that they've operated as an organization and as a business and the human element of that too. Um, By the way, I, I, I love that you started there. I think that's the most important thing in investing. When people say, hey, Bill, what's your investing strategy? I always tell them, I invest in leaders. Now, it's I generally stay in technology because I know and understand it. I don't understand natural gas and oil, and I, so I don't invest in those things. But I invest in leadership in companies that I understand their business. That's And the leadership, I think, makes all the difference because the world is going to change and those leaders can change with it. Yep, for sure. I thought the pilot uh, tying into Home Hero and the guidance around uh, taking caution with uh, weighing too heavily on pilots that may not turn into reliable and sustainable revenue was interesting. And I think that really applies to if you're looking to invest in an organization, I think it applies there. I think it applies to a health system. I think it applies to a more established vendor of how much of your uh, spend investment you put into more innovative edge pilot type use cases and the actual pilots for those, how much you look into shoring up foundation, which is perhaps a uh, less in a startup and a little bit more in a health system or even an established vendor. But you, you have to figure out where am I going to draw that line? Where am I going to balance so that I am moving forward? I am productively pushing the envelope, but I've also got strength and foundation so that if some of these initiatives drop, they don't play out. Uh, what does that look like? And we see that too, because there's some spaces where we're using ServiceNow in ways that are not traditional. They're far from ITSM. We've got a real neat one that we're doing right now that's in a pilot with a health system that is focused on lowering first-year nurse attrition. So we're putting tooling in place inside of ServiceNow that includes the mobile app on their actual clinical devices on the floor, the mobile devices that gets the first-year nurses access to a nurse mentor, access to learning resources through their LMSs and things like that, but readily within that tooling, provides analytics, all that kind of stuff. So you have these really neat use cases where you have the potential to make more of an impact, but you're also taking a little bit more of a risk because it's not a paven route. It's not a proven and established model. And there are a handful of others I could call out there too. So I think it's about finding a balance and based off of what's being invested in the long-term proven viability of that, and then weighing that against more established proven use cases and other revenue streams, frankly. Yeah, it's, we heard the term death by pilot over and over again, especially in these startups. The use case you're talking about is interesting because it's, I would assume it's a, the healthcare system is generating the pilot for the nurses. I would assume they're the ones who you're working with and whatnot. So you, you don't have to worry about the revenue stream of the company and making payroll and all those kinds of things because it's, it, you're, you're taking an existing system and you're making it much more efficient and more effective. But You know, what does it take for that to go from pilot to, all right, we're ready to roll that out at scale? 
successful execution, uh, proven data after we've done it to show that it actually had an impact, which I think takes time. You've got to have the right pilot period so that you could say, all right, these are what our numbers looked like at the beginning. We rolled this out only at this particular hospital with this size of a clinical community. Um, and then based off of that, 12 months later, we've seen that within that period, our numbers had dropped this much. And even then, of course, there are so many other variables that can play in. So we've got to extend that, expand it and see how it works. But I think it goes into the design of your pilot as well and building it in such a way so that it, it's not living in a silo or on its own. It is designed in such a way that it can scale out to the full health system, ideally, but to its full intended market within its within its context and is built in such a way that it has a viable future and it won't fall off once you get beyond its its initial narrow scope. Fantastic. Great conversation. Robert Elliott, Optimum Healthcare IT, VP of the Services Now Practice. If people wanted more information on the practice and the work that you guys are doing, where could they go? Yep, you can uh, go to our website, OptimumHIT.com. Our LinkedIn, of course, we're putting a lot of content out there on a regular basis with the subject matter experts from our team. So either of those can definitely reach out. Fantastic. Robert, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. And that is the news. If I were a CIO today, I think what I would do is I'd have every team member listening to a show just like this one and trying to have conversations with them after the show about what they've learned and what we can apply to our health system. If you want to support This Week Health, one of the ways you can do that is you can recommend our channels to a peer or to one of your staff members. We have two channels, This Week Health Newsroom and This Week Health Conference. You can check them out anywhere you listen to podcasts, which is a lot of places, Apple, Google, Overcast, Spotify, you name it, you can find it there. You can also find us on YouTube. And of course, you can go to our website, thisweekhealth.com. And we want to thank our Newsday partners, again, a lot of them, and we appreciate their participation in this show. Cedar sinai Accelerator, ClearSense, CrowdStrike, Digital Scientists, Optimum, Pure Storage, SureTest, TauSite, Lumion, and VMware, who have invested in our mission to develop the next generation of health leaders. Thanks for listening. That's all for now.